Yeah. All right. Here we go. It's just a little area. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. Okay. So, <clears throat> are we thankful for them? I mean, nobody wants to pack a bag and go and fit in there, but hey, sometimes it's necessary. Even when we know that somebody, while well, they made poor choices, they probably could have avoided the crisis, but I mean, gosh, I still, my heart just goes out to the people in the beds. I mean, they go in there to get better, they have to do it by themselves, they're away from family, the food is atrocious, you can't sleep, ugh. But thank God for the pros, right? The years of training, the shift work, the long hours, the exposure to bodily fluids, the risk to themselves, the cost to their families. I mean, honk if you support them, right? And it gives me a brain cramp trying to imagine being the administrator. Uh, you gotta keep everybody safe, stay compliant, meet all of these conflicting needs, stay under budget. Who needs that kind of stress in their workplace? I am so glad that they built this one close to my neighborhood. Oh my gosh, this is so embarrassing. That's the wrong slide. Can you please go to the next one? Okay, there we go. Aren't we thankful for them? Nobody wants to pack a bag and move in there. But hey, I mean, sometimes it's necessary. Even when we know that somebody could have made better choices, they probably could have prevented a crisis. But even so, I mean, my heart just goes out to the people in the beds. You know, they go in there to get better, but they have to do it alone, away from family. The food is atrocious, and it's almost impossible to sleep. Oh, but thank God for the professionals. The years that they put into training, the long hours, the shift work, the exposure to bodily fluids, the risk to themselves, the cost to their families. How do you support them? And it gives me a brain cramp trying to imagine what it's like running one of these facilities. Keeping everybody safe, staying compliant, meeting all of these conflicting needs, and still coming in under budget. Who needs that kind of stress in their work? I am so glad they built this one close to my neighborhood. Said no one, ever. <laughs> I am Sabrina Justison. I'm the founder and executive director of Prison Care Incorporated. We are a 501c3 nonpartisan nonprofit organization. And I think that as a society, we have a really weird relationship with prisons. So society has mandated that we have prisons. They say we gotta have them, that may not be true. But at this point in history, they have mandated the use and um, existence of prisons. And the stated purposes of hospitals and prisons are actually very similar, right? People are sent there in an attempt to get them better so they can return home and they can be healthy, contributing members of our society at large. There are plenty of people in hospitals because they chose to abuse substances themselves. They refuse to take responsibility for their health. But even when I understand the role of personal responsibility, I still have compassion, even when I'm the picture of health. Our thought is that the sooner they get better, the sooner they can be discharged, right? Now, similarly, next slide, please. The majority of people who are serving a prison sentence are experiencing incarceration because of situations that their personal choices probably exacerbated but we have zero compassion for them. We say, if you didn't want to go to prison, then you shouldn't have broken the law, and that would never be me. We really hope that they're gonna get their crap together before they're released, but we also think that they should probably serve at least most of their sentence, because, I mean, early release is like a risky thing. We relate to the patients at a hospital, and the staff in the hospital, and we other the people who are in prison. And that's how we have the weird story. Next slide, please. Let's talk about the people inside the prison who wear a different uniform. Why do we have a deep respect for doctors and nurses and aides in a hospital? But if somebody at a cocktail party tells us that they're a corrections officer or an assistant warden, it's like kind of weird. Your daughter is an ER nurse? Oh my gosh. I can never do it. I don't have a strong enough stomach. But I'm so glad that there are people who are smart and dedicated. Oh, you must be so proud of her. Your daughter's a corrections officer? Like, prison guard? Seriously? Oh, there's not enough money in the world. Did you try to talk her out of it? 
somehow we walk away with a vague sense that that corrections professional is just a little off. I mean, who would want to go to work in a prison every day? And let's face it, there's one very simple difference between most people's relationships to hospitals and prisons, and that's proximity. We're glad to live near a hospital. We're glad to not live near a prison. We drive past hospitals regularly. We get a visual reminder that they are there because people get sick and they need some place to go to get better. We don't want to drive past prisons, and we almost never do because they're built in the middle of nowhere. And that's really kind of okay with us because we don't really want a daily visual reminder that there are people who need to live behind razor wire. We all personally know somebody who's been in the hospital in the last five years, and yet many of us don't personally know anyone who's been incarcerated. Or we don't know that we know someone who's been incarcerated because the stigma is so profound that people don't share. If we want regular folks, regular folks, okay, I'm at a criminal justice conference, but regular folks with no connection to criminal justice professions, to care about what's happening inside prisons, we have to create proximity. And as things stand today, we have a society that requires the existence and use of prisons. But we don't want to work in them, we don't want to see them, we don't want to think about them, and we don't want to think about the folks that do. Out of sight, out of mind, please and thank you. Doesn't matter which side of the spectrum, politically or philosophically, you fall on, okay? People who consider themselves tough on crime very rarely throw correctional officer appreciation events. They almost never fundraise to provide mental health treatment for an officer who's been traumatized by an incident at work. Opposite end of the spectrum, People who are all about decarceration, prison abolition, and early release are typically not involved in actually improving the quality of the culture inside the prisons that do exist right now and are full to overflowing with people. We're having to wait for legislative change that's hopefully going to come top down. But there are people right now. And maybe this is a part of the answer to the problem. Prison care thinks maybe it can be. Either end of the spectrum can be oblivious to prisons, which means that either end of the spectrum can be brought into proximity with prisons. We need a paradigm shift and we need some tools for change. Next slide, please. Prison Care Incorporated in early 2022, so we are the new kids on the block. Our origin story, in a nutshell, I'm a veteran homeschool mom turned homeschool curriculum publisher. I had no background in anything to do with corrections. I did not know anyone who had been incarcerated until my next to youngest son went to prison five years ago. There was no moment in Jay's childhood when any of us thought, something is seriously wrong with this kid. He's never any trouble with the law, any other kind of authority, tons of healthy community involvement, many great friendships. There was never a reason that anybody who met him would have expected that something like this would even be possible. Jay and his wife are now both serving sentences for murder and other burglary charges. They are in prisons in Colorado. I am happy to share Jay's story if you want to hear it. Later in the session, we'll have some space for questions. If you want to know more about what he did, how it all unfolded, please feel free to ask. We're a totally open book. I just don't want to waste our time here when we're looking at prison care models. So we can talk about that later, or you can go to Prison Care's sister site, which is my name, sabrinajustison.com, and I've written about it pretty extensively there, so you can read it on your own. Um, suffice it to say that in September 2018, after having been arrested in January, on the advice of court appointed counsel, Jay accepted a plea deal and was sentenced to 68 years in prison. His wife chose to be tried separately, and after a series of delays in November 2020, she went to trial, was convicted of first-degree murder, among other charges. She was sentenced to life without parole, plus 48. The years since Jay's sentencing have been a journey of reconnection and recalibration. As he began to work intently on his mental health, where there were some serious problems, I supported him with whatever resources I could cobble together from the outside. And we began to actually see hope growing. Not just in the two of us, but in people around us people around me on the outside, and people around him on the inside. In 2019, I began writing to some of Jay's buddies in prison. 
And as I got to know my incarcerated pen pals better, I started to hear about these challenges that they were facing that, surprising to all of us, the correction staff were also typically facing. Same challenges, different uniform. When COVID-19 put the prison on months-long lockdown, I gathered friends around me to form the first prison care compassion team. The game changer for me was that early in COVID, I saw the Facebook profile of a correctional officer who had framed her profile picture with a little circle that said, I can't stay home to save lives, I'm a corrections officer. And it was an aha moment for me. And I thought, oh boy, she's a person. And I need to care about what this is doing to her. And there's a whole lot of other people who are wearing her uniform, and every single one of them is in that same boat. Our first prison care compassion team began writing letters of encouragement to incarcerated people. Now I'm sure you're going, prison pen pals, blah, blah, blah. Yes, I know. <laughs> Not that kind of pen pals. And there's a whole level of pen pal. There's the shallow pen pal. We're just leaving out the, you know, those kind of pen pals. And we're talking about there's shallow pen pals, there's generic form letter pen pals, and then there's pen pal encouragers. And that, for a lot of people, takes a little bit of training and a little bit of equipping. And we're going to get to that in just a minute. But we also exchanged artwork, and we started um, curating mental wellness resources, and in some cases, adapting and creating mental wellness resources to send into people who were working really hard on themselves and couldn't Google it. It's really hard to get better by yourself when you have no resources, right? As Jay and I kept talking and brainstorming ways to make a positive impact on the people around him, we began to recognize that each prison is a neighborhood. It's an uneasy neighborhood, it's made up of residents, correctional officers, other kinds of staff, administrators, but it's a neighborhood. They are all in close proximity to one another 24-7. And what impacts one population within a neighborhood may very well be impacting everybody else. If the sewer backs up in your neighborhood, everybody stinks. And if you repair the sewer in that neighborhood, everybody's health improves, right? It was a powerful image for us, and it began to really create a holistic lens through which I was seeing prisons, and I was able to talk to others about it. And strangely enough, Jay was able to talk to others on the inside, looking through that lens as well. Um, I think we're popping to the next one. Yes. Thank you. What had been an us versus them environment in prisons that compromises the physical and mental health of all who live there could potentially become a place for mutual respect, healthy rapport and the recognition of our shared humanity could create a more positive culture. Even while true reform and system down, you know, changes are, are something that we're waiting for and waiting for, people on the outside, ordinary people, could still be making a difference for the people who are currently behind the fence. In particular, the mental health needs of prison residents and correctional staff are overwhelming. On the average, three corrections officers die by suicide per week in the United States of America. Did you know that? It should not be that way. Incarcerated individuals are more than twice as likely to be significantly mentally ill as those who are not incarcerated. There's all kinds of stats, and you can, you can go and fill your brain to overflowing with stats. And I'm just going to tell you, this, this whole thing today, anecdotal, guys, no research. <laughs> No, I, I have nothing. I don't even know what Envivo is, and I didn't. I thought coding was like when you, you know, put your clothes in the closet, all the blues, all the greens, all the reds. I thought that was coding, apparently not. So ordinary people, ordinary people don't know any of this. Ordinary people like the person I was until I suddenly had a loved one who was incarcerated five years ago. We don't pay attention because it's really easy to ignore, right? We don't have to pay attention. There are other things clamoring for our attention, but if it's put on the radar of ordinary people, I think there are a lot of them who will care. They've just never thought about it. The more proximity that ordinary folks on the outside have to the realities of a prison neighborhood, the less likely they will be to ignore it. In the years since Jay's sentencing, I've been learning a whole new normal for my own life. <laughs> and how. <laughs> I'm getting exposed to a whole new reality, that of people who are incarcerated and their families, but also of corrections officers and their families, and case managers and their families. I'm living in response to all of this by working 
but prison reform from a grassroots level. There are two retired corrections professionals who serve on my advisory board. I am blessed to have a career um, CO, retired now, and a retired um, juvenile uh, case manager and administrator who are helping to inform me. I also have two board members, Jay and Dylan, who are currently incarcerated. And they are part of our board and they are helping to inform our growth. Prison is a toxic environment for everybody inside, whether they live out their sentences there or whether they get paid to show up there in a different uniform. But in my search for organizations that were seeking to bring about support for everybody inside a prison, I found nothing. Nothing. Every group was dedicated to lobbying for change from the top down. Awesome. Advocating for the rights of inmates. Awesome working for better training and pay, and working conditions for corrections professionals. Also awesome. But there was nobody looking at the prison as a whole and saying, what could we do while things are still so very unfixed in the greater sense? Are there little tiny things, you know, Mother Teresa, do small things with great love, right? Little tiny dribbles of something that could improve it for even one person. Everything that I found sounded like a zero-sum game. The correction staff gets what they need, which hurts the residents. The inmates get what they need, which overtaxes the already exhausted staff. Somebody has to lose for somebody else to win. Nobody was thinking of it as a neighborhood, a space in which making things better for one group will also make it better for the other. Most people on the outside are not wired to go inside and volunteer anyway. So I was also looking for something that ordinary people on the outside who get this on the radar and go, that's not okay, and I would want to be doing something small. Ordinary people like the person I was until I suddenly had a loved one who was incarcerated five years ago. We don't pay attention because it's really easy to ignore, right? We don't have to pay attention. There are other things clamoring for our attention, but if it's put on the radar of ordinary people, I think there are a lot of them who will care. They just never thought about it. The more proximity that ordinary folks on the outside have to the realities of a prison neighborhood, the less likely they will be to ignore it. In the years since Jay's sentencing, I've been learning a whole new normal from my own life. <laughs> and how. <laughs> I'm getting exposed to a whole new reality, that of people who are incarcerated and their families, but also of corrections officers and their families, and case managers and their families. I'm living in response to all of this by working for prison reform from a grassroots level. There are two retired corrections professionals who serve on my advisory board. I am blessed to have a career um, CO, retired now, and a retired um, juvenile uh, case manager and administrator who are helping to inform me. I also have two board members, Jay and Dylan, who are currently incarcerated. And they are part of our board and they are helping to inform our growth. For instance, a toxic environment for everybody inside, whether they live out their sentences there or whether they get paid to show up there in a different uniform. But in my search for organizations that were seeking to bring about support for everybody inside a prison, I found nothing. Nothing. Every group was dedicated to lobbying for change from the top down. Awesome. Advocating for the rights of inmates. Awesome. Working for better training and pay and working conditions for corrections professionals. Also awesome. But there was nobody looking at the prison as a whole and saying, what could we do while things are still so very unfixed in the greater sense? Are there little tiny things, you know, Mother Teresa, do small things with great love, right? Little tiny dribbles of something that could improve it for even one person. Everything that I found sounded like a zero sum game. The correction staff gets what they need, which hurts the residents. The inmates get what they need, which overtaxes the already exhausted staff. Somebody has to lose for somebody else to win. Nobody was thinking of it as a neighborhood, a space in which making things better for one group will also make it better for the other group. 
Most people on the outside are not wired to go inside and volunteer anyway. So I was also looking for something that ordinary people on the outside who get this on the radar and go, that's not okay, and I would want to be doing something small, but it has to be something small. I'm not getting background checked, and I'm not going through the sally port. I'm not doing it. It's just not me, right? So I started for them here incorporated. Next slide, please. And Jay and I are the co-founders. He is the inside co-founder, and I am the outside. We are seeking to raise awareness and educate and empower average folks to support positive changes in the culture of a specific prison that they choose to adopt. So prison stops being this nebulous thing, and it becomes a place, a neighborhood, with people in it that you commit to. Um, I found that the loved ones of incarcerated individuals are fantastic places to look for my compassion team leaders. It takes very little. They just need a little bit of equipping. They need a little bit of strategy and a couple of tools to share, and they will rally people around them and adopt the facility where their loved one's incarcerated. They feel helpless and powerless since their loved one went down, right? And when you say to them, you're actually not helpless. Guess what? You can't fix the big thing, but you can make it a little bit less toxic. Do you wanna? They go, anything, anything, right? They're primed for it. First prison care compassion team uh, was started in my own home church. That was who was on screen a second ago. And uh, the prison that we chose to adopt, surprisingly, huh, was Jay's in Colorado. So you can do it from a distance, too. I'm in Maryland. He's in Colorado. I have a lot of frequent flyer miles. <laughs> Jay is the co-founder of this endeavor because he is convinced by his own personal growth, in spite of mental illness, that anybody who's incarcerated can find rehabilitation, greater health, and purpose in life with just a little bit of compassionate support from the outside. And he's trying to encourage the residents around him to choose to work for positive change. He's helping connect guys who are willing to try with supporters outside of fence. He and others like Dylan, whom you're going to hear from in a minute, are also dreaming and strategizing ways to create culture inside. To be, as they have decided to call themselves, change engines. Now, we usually use the term, you know, a, a change agent, acting change agent, right? But the agent is the catalyst. It's the thing that goes and start something, right? The guys have decided for reasons that you'll have explained in a moment, they want to be change engines because the engine is the thing that takes that energy and it turns it into motion. And they want to start living out positive culture because of the prison care vision that's been the catalyst for them. That is our story, as best I can put it into words quickly. When you look at it, we never should have ended up here. This shouldn't have been possible, right? From my comfortable, well-educated, white suburban perspective, I mean, I was stunned when my child went to prison. But you know, there are other moms who are just as loving and committed and smart and whatever who experience the impact of incarceration on their families with every generation, simply as a result of racism, poverty, educational inequity, mental illness, and more. Oh, and mental illness, BT does. My dedicated and intentional parenting meant that I was stunned when my kids plural, because I have more than one kid who deals with mental illness, began manifesting symptoms. But then I learned that there are actually other moms out there who parent their kids just as lovingly and who are just as terrified when they see symptoms begin to emerge in their child's life and who don't know how to get help because there's such limited resources and what you can't find is so expensive. But here's the deal. Catastrophe does not get the final word in the story, unless I allow it to. There are no guaranteed outcomes, but we can choose how we will respond to catastrophe. We could say, as Jay has taught me to say, circumstances being what they are, and me being who I choose to be. And we can finish our sentences from there. Circumstances being what they are, and me being who I choose to be. I believe in redemption. And so I live as if there are still lives to be redeemed from the tragedies that brought them to incarceration. And I hope to see those efforts result in a better environment for corrections professionals as well. If our personal tragedy can lead to healthier living in even one prison neighborhood, that's a huge win. In 2022, we incorporated, we became a 501c3 tax exempt nonprofit, and I'm now committing to, committed to raising awareness via the Prison Care Podcast, speaking engagements and to creating free curriculum 
on our website PDF and video curriculum resources to help compassion teams form, to help people learn how to be pen pal encourages, to use a virtues based vocabulary in their writing. And in light of that, I'm going to do something interactive. Y'all have been listening so intently, and I appreciate that. So if everybody has a phone and you can pull out your notes app and do voice to text, we're going to play with our phones for a minute. I'm not going to make you do anything with this. I'm not going to steal your phone and send this to somebody who's incarcerated. Okay, this is just an exercise. But this is an exercise that I do with compassion teams when they are first trying to get off the ground. So there's a lot of people who say, I don't write letters. I'm not a writer. It's not my thing, right? When we say write a letter to someone, it sounds like a school assignment to them. They're like, Ugh. they think they have to write longhand, and they think they have to use good penmanship. And that whole thing, no, 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 conversation and relationships. So we're going to pop through this exercise and then we'll set several of these. Being a pen pal encourager, 10 minutes or less to true awesomeness. When I created this, I thought it took 10 minutes. It actually takes about seven and a half. All right, so one more, please. So think of them as messages, not letters. Okay? Think conversational, think almost text message rather than letter. You're simply sending a reminder that they matter to somebody on the outside. This is like, you're going to use technology. No penmanship required. Voice to text using the notes app on your phone. Give it a quick proofread and send it to your printer. It's that easy. Next slide, please. You add a personal touch, signing it by hand. Perhaps adding a little one line PS or a doodle by hand. Because it's nice for people to see your handwriting. And then you mail it. Next slide, please. So let's do it. All right. So I passed out some. Um, it, there was quite enough, enough, so if you don't have one, get with somebody who does have one. Yes. So, so maybe so it's share with Loretta. Yes, yeah. 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 If you've already looked at it and remember what a little bit of what it says, just pass it off to somebody. <laughs> These are questionnaires that came from a few of our um, incarcerated friends when they signed up for a pen pal encourager. So when they request um, a, a pen pal encourager, we first send them a sheet, there's an information sheet up here, you can look at it after if you're interested, but that explains all the things that our compassion team offers because this is flexible. Different groups of people are able to offer different things, they have different amounts of time and energy, right? So we send them a welcome letter and say, hi, this is who we are, and here's a questionnaire, tell us who you are. So what you're holding are just a few of the questionnaires that we've gotten back from people. Gives you a tiny glimpse into who they are. With that information, each of you is going to voice to text into your little note app. Just put it close to your mouth so that it picks up what you're saying and not what your neighbor is saying. Dear, whatever their first name is, we don't use last names because they hear their last name and their DOC number all day long, every day, and nobody calls them what their mom and named them. So we always just put formality out the window. First name, dear so-and-so, nice to meet you. I hear you like the prison care pen pal encourager. I guess I should start by telling you a little bit about myself. On your marks, get set, go. You can do it. And you can go to like go to a place. Yeah, you can go to someplace else if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it real short and simple and just look at me when you're done. You guys are such good sports. Okay, next slide. Now, you're going to choose four starters. So I have um, in stack someplace that I can't find. Here we go. So this is one free downloads at presentcare.org. You don't need it for now. Uh, it's a whole bunch of of prompts, writing prompts, just first line, you know, first little part of a line, just to help people. Everybody says, I don't know what to write. I don't know what to tell them. It's weird to write to a stranger. Like, Ugh, it's just weird. What do I say? Whole bunch of prompts to just get you saying something. All right. So I have chosen four starters for us today, but there's a whole bunch on here that you could have chosen from. I do blank for a living. I loved or hated school when I was young, whatever the correct choice for you is there. I'm left-handed, or I'm right-handed. I grew up in a large family, I grew up in a small family. That's it, just four little tiny short sentences. Go. I'm a student. 
Are we ready to roll on? Okay, next slide, please. Now, you're going to reflect back one specific thing that your new friend said on your questionnaire. This is so important. I'm going to read you a letter a little bit later from one of our friends where he talks about this. So that they know that you are not sending them a form letter, but that you are personally responding to them. So you're going to dictate into your note. Now, here's where you just pick something from the questionnaire that you looked at. In your letter, you said you, and then say it back. You said you were lonely. You said you're working on your GED. You said you're a dog trainer in your dog program. You said you're looking at a lot of years. Whatever it is, if it's something positive, respond with a couple of appropriate words like, that's great. If it's something negative, respond with something appropriate like, that must be really hard, or I feel for you. What you're doing is you're letting them know that they are seen as an individual with unique feelings and experiences. All right, so pick something from the questionnaire to respond to, and go. All right, let's roll. Next slide. We're so close to done, you can't even believe it. Express interest. We're going to choose two starters from the list. Again, this is on that same free download, and it's things to get people started with what this, let me, um, how, do you, how do you get them to want to follow up where they feel comfortable? Because here's the funny thing, you guys, the people who are serving prison sentences, they say, I didn't know what to write. I didn't know how to write to a stranger. It's just kind of weird. They're feeling it the same way we are. So they need a little bit of coaxing, all right? So choose, uh, I'm choosing two starters from the list for you. And we're gonna use these to dictate if you know. Tell me a little bit more about yourself. Are you a morning person or a night owl? It's a nice, safe question. It's personal, but it's not intrusive. And would you describe yourself as shy or outgoing? I'm looking forward to hearing from you again. Okay, so now you just asked them two questions about themselves and said, I'm looking forward to an answer. I hope I'm going to hear back from you. Ready, set, go. Okay, next slide, bring it on home. Choose a closing line from the list. There's a whole bunch of closing lines on here. I chose a couple. You could also make up your own if you want, you're allowed. <laughs> It'll be cool to get to know one another or I hope my letter brought you a smile today. Go for it. All right, next slide. That's the whole process, you guys. You voice to text it in the notes app on your phone. You quick proofread it. You send it to your printer. You sign it. You maybe add a little one-line PS or a doodle, and you mail it. It's that easy. You can do it at a really long stoplight. A really long stoplight. But still, the, the, you know, the idea is there. Okay. Next one, please. All right, so... I'm going to share with you just a little bit of what our friends on the inside have said back to us in response to some of the letters that they've gotten that started just like that. One friend said, I think we cling really hard to the relationships we have because making new ones is almost impossible. Your vision for prison care is awesome. The outside influences in my life are probably the most important right now. Now, what you just dictated into your phone was really shallow and surface, right? Are you a coffee drinker or a tea drinker, right? It feels artificial, 
and it feels like small talk, and it takes almost no time before you're having people share insights like that. This becomes relationship so quickly. Someone else said, I like finding new friends and starting new relationships, but it's a little hard for me to open up to people I don't know. But I'm trying new things, and that's why I keep writing to you and your team. I hope this letter helps you keep getting to know me better. I look forward to writing and talking to you. I don't get any other mail here, so please write as much as possible, okay? One of my oldest pen pals wrote this. <clears throat> getting a letter in prison brings smiles. Not getting letters reminds us we're not important. I apologize you didn't invite it, but if I may add my two cents here, the two most important things one should keep in mind when writing an inmate are to be sincere and consistent. We can spot a form letter a mile away. Form letters are obligatory and therefore insincere. Writers should do as you have done. Use the inmate's first name on the inside of the letter and write encouragement about the things that the inmate has brought up. These two things alone give the feeling of it's personal, I'm important to somebody. Again, Sabrina, thank you for writing. It puts a smile on my soul. Another friend said, these circumstances aren't the easiest, but I did get myself here after all. There's definitely opportunities for growth here, even with somewhat limited programs. Another thing that surprised me about prison is the number of intelligent, gifted people there are that I've been lucky to come across and learn things from. Don't get me wrong, you still have the knuckleheads, old and young, but those who complain just about everything, which is also too easy to do here. But that stuff is still avoidable, especially if I keep surrounding myself with like-minded, growth-oriented people. We inmates appreciate you. I have been sure to mention prison care to my classmates. Another one, it seems that a lot of us who are incarcerated do need someone to correspond with. Being patient with getting letters will be a challenge due to the fact that this past nine and a half years I have gone without. Yeah, it's hard, but the only thing I can do is work towards staying positive. If I can do any kind of good with my life, that is all I can hope for. And if I can make friends on the way who could be positive encouragement and support, even better. I have a couple of prison hustles. I clean cells, I do laundry, just t-shirts. I make a fair amount of stamps and a little food. But with the economy as it is, my mom and dad took a pretty good hit to their retirement funds. And so their financial assistance has been reduced to an occasional access pack. So instead of relying on them, I've chosen to work more. And I'm doing pretty good at it. If inmates can't change or be rehabilitated, then why invest anything in them? That's one thing I would like to work on when I get out. I've met a lot of good guys in here who made the wrong choice and now the rest of their life they will suffer. It's not how it should be. I understand doing time for what you did. But how about bettering yourself while you're here so that you can return to society and be productive? And this short and sweet. Thanks for writing. It made a world of difference to matter to someone even a little bit. This last one is from Dylan. Dylan is our Inside Programs Director. Dylan is a wonderful human being. Um, and this is what he wrote to me right after we formally um, added them to the board of Prison Care Incorporated. The love you have for all of us is so evident in the work you do. You have not only given me a voice, but you're giving everyone that I've seen and talked to a voice. They may not know it, that their stories are being told and their experiences shared and that real change is going to happen because of it. But I only hope that someday they will see that the pain they have gone through has not gone unnoticed. Just having you and your circle around me, giving me opportunity to work with you, giving me a chance to be who I've always wanted to be, and the platform to be exactly who I am for the first time in my life has completely changed my life. I feel like I have a future, a chance I didn't think I'd have even pre-incarceration. The lack of judgment for what I've done is something exceptional in and of itself. Thank you so much for giving voice to the voiceless. In a more formal capacity, Jay, our inside co-founder, and Dylan, our inside programs director, prepared a piece for me to share with you today. They called it their essay. I have to tell you they took their time with it, and I got it at 9 o'clock last night. But that was not because they were procrastinating. It's because they had created a version that they really liked a couple of weeks ago. But they went around talking to their friends and finding out, do you feel like this is a good representation? Is this what you want people to hear from inside our facility? 
And in talking to people, they started to feel uncomfortable because they said, we're telling people stories and people haven't given us consent to do that. And that's not respectful. Maybe they're not ready to have their personal stories told yet. So we took all the storytelling out of it. And instead, we wrote it in a more philosophical sense. So I want you to know, I thought, and what I asked them for, was stories from the inside. And they collected them, and then out of their tremendous commitment to respecting each person as an individual, they said, I don't think we can do that this time, Mom, not in a public, formal way. So I'm going to share with you what they wrote. And in case you were wondering if we are truly grassroots, my office is in my garage, and I'm reading to you from a Disney Frozen notebook. <laughs> How's that for professional ACJS? Did you come again in Vivo? I did not, <laughs> nor shall I. Next slide so we can see the guys while I'm reading to you what they wrote. So that's them. Dylan's the tall one, and Jane's my baby. And they recently participated in the My Song for Life songwriting program that Mark and Tammy Polly offer in some of the core civic facilities, and they make music together too. So now you can see their little faces while I read you their words. <clears throat> can the reform that all of you are aiming to see happen in the criminal justice system be brought about from inside its prisons? That's something we're trying to figure out. What started as a basic desire to ignore the stereotypical prison archetype in order simply and selfishly to try to be happy while we're living here, at some point morphed into a whole new archetype that we've come to call a change engine. Adapted from a comic book universe, this overly theatrical designation reminds us to both dream big, to believe that the justice system isn't damned to remain broken, while also remembering not to take things too seriously. There's already a tendency in prison to dramatize the mundane and the petty. Honestly, that's how most fights come about. On the outs, someone calling you a rude name doesn't automatically demand a violent response, yeah? But inside, there are a dozen proposed moral reasons why a fight has to be the go-to solution for name calling. But unfortunately, at its core, there's simply no good story in it. Standing up for yourself standing up against the blight of disrespect, if you pay no mind to a verbal insult. Or so the institutionalized thought goes. So then, what is the hoped for difference? It's in a change engine's character. It's almost silly how simple principles are, yet also how frustrating and how challenging it can be to walk in them. The system has been hardwired to promote a never-ending us-versus-them mentality. And not only the resident versus the staff, but even the resident versus the fellow resident. Now, whatever beliefs you may hold, all can likely agree that treating others the way you want to be treated is a fundamental, an ideal goal, right? But inside the fences, that goal cannot be pursued directly. There's too much instilled contention that causes consistent misconstruction. The purest intentions are rarely trusted. Paranoia is constantly in play. Letting someone go in front of you to use the shared pod microwave might only make that person feel that they're being set up for a confrontation rather than being shown a common courtesy. Thus, a more abstract approach has to be taken. In a black and white system, a change engine has to find the gray. The blending of the ideals of innocence with the prideful delusions born of the system kind of sounds impossible. Yet, through trial and error, we're actually finding the ability to accomplish just that. A change engine knows their own worth for their own sake, establishing healthy boundaries while maintaining the ability to have actively positive relationships. A change engine never acts in self-interest alone, but finds a way to make the meeting of their own needs also benefit others. A change engine believes and dreams that things can always be better while also seeking to fulfill their unique role in bringing those dreams about. And what are those dreams exactly? Put plainly, prison has to change, a total reconstruction. But for that to successfully happen, all preceding parts of the criminal justice system must also change. Prison is the final act, the culmination of justice and rehabilitation, and it means nothing to only impact one branch. There is an entire tree that needs to be treated. If cops, district attorneys, judges, and lawmakers don't become re-educated and grasp this new vision and mindset, then the best we can hope for is that prisons will become cozier. 
The softer mattresses and the blue jeans from Walmart are desired comforts, make no mistake. But the comforts alone can't create better humans. There must be a vivid vision driving it all, a goal far, far beyond better pacification of restless inmates. From the moment the handcuffs first click, the whole process should be actively about true re rehabilitation, being given deep and legitimate tools to uncover our meaning and purpose. Becoming a proper citizen who can pay taxes and hold a job is fine, but it's hollow. For true character growth to take place, we must be given chances right now to impact the outside world in positive ways. We need the opportunities to see that we are worthy of doing and being more, if only we want and choose to do and be more. Now, many of these possible opportunities don't yet exist, and as current residents of the system, there isn't much we can do to bring them into play. That's a task for citizens with their freedom to take on. However, as change engines acting on the inside, there are other much more available avenues we can take that run parallel to the ones available to you on the outs, and we are already traversing them. Inside, we've realized that we can create community, one that takes note of everyone equally, rather than perpetuating the us versus them mentality. We've been making an effort to change the way we interact with both fellow residents and with staff who work in our facility. By envisioning and then creating leadership roles for ourselves within our designated environments, we are bringing about opportunities to encourage and empower prison residents to see beyond this current culture. Where small slights could ruin someone's chance at parole, where the only escape is self-isolation or substance abuse or violence, we hope and work to set an example for positive, meaningful ways that residents can interact with each other and the staff much more in line with the citizens that we will one day become. Hand in hand with that is the relationship between prison residents and correctional officers. Developing empathetic rapport with staff is just as crucial as our relationships with each other. Having conversations about how they're doing, practicing respect and patience and politeness, even when disagreements occur, this all goes a long way to building mutual understanding between staff and residents. We've seen how residents usually treat staff, and vice versa. The mugging looks, the puffed chest, the inappropriate jeers, it's all antagonistic, offensive, and altogether unproductive. Whether living or working, we are all persons in prison. And the prison care mission is about total reform for all parties involved. For the two of us, we want to be seen as real persons. And that requires us to first do the same for the officers. Through our vision and successive action, we aim to inspire other residents to make shifts in their own attitudes and actions. At the same time, we hope to foster more respect and appropriate levels of trust from COs by being persons of integrity, committing ourselves to being engines of positive change that will allow for true reform to take hold. When we talk of change, we're talking about a real, tangible difference that means something, not just supporting the newest fad or a political game. The future criminal justice system we're striving for will serve ourselves, our families, and the victims with their respective families. As it stands, all parties are categorized, separated, and divided, but we are all affected. And our diverse needs must be attended to if a bright future is in the future. That was a lot. All right. Um, now I want you to hear a big slide from Dr. Hattery, sure. the University of Delaware, who has dabbled a bit as a friend of prison. <coughs> so, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think what I really appreciate about Sabrina's approach, I don't want to say what I is trying to find ways that, that provide opportunities for faculty or people, other people who have that kind of access with students at a facility that can be on a continuum. So many people, I know McKenzie, for example, people are involved in the Inside Out program. And the Inside Out program is a really awesome program. It's also very labor intensive, very expensive, uh, et cetera, and so forth. And so, so what I tried to do was come up with some ways. I said to Sabrina, what, what can I do? How can I help? Where can I start? And she said back to me, you need to do something, you need to find the prison where you want to be, where you want to create a relationship. 
And so I started to think about the fact that not far from the University of Delaware, well, Delaware is small anyway, but not far from the University of Delaware is women's prison. And that would be, would be a natural um, sort of connection for me because my PhD is in sociology, but I'm in a women and gender studies program. So, and much of my research focuses on gender and racial inequality. So I thought, okay, I teach courses that are connected to gender and thinking about the criminal legal system. What are some things I could do that don't require all of the investment? Not that I'm not willing to do all of the investment, but a little bit like prison care's approach. Why not start with something? You don't have to wait until you're ready to do the whole thing. Why don't you start with something? And so I reached out again, Sabrina's advice was, talk to the person at, the name of the person is Baylor, talk to the person at Baylor who can, who can make some things happen. And so I reached out and found out who that person was, and we just started talking on the phone. And we, we, we talked through a number of different ideas, and part of what I said was, I don't want this to be my thing. This needs to be something that you think you need, right? And so the, this was from our first idea. The first idea was, and also this is mid-semester, right? So not really a lot of time to reorganize a whole class. I was teaching a class called Women in Violence, and it was in the fall semester. And we, we arrived on, again, male, right? But the, the person who works at Baylor was uncomfortable with any sort of a pen pal and any kind of an exchange between students and incarcerated people just like connected to each other without a middle conduit person that she'd had some negative experiences with that in the past and didn't want to do that and i think that there were safety reasons but i also know that undergraduates in my experience no offense to those of you who are um but it can, can be kind of transient like it's exciting today but next week i graduate or i'm done with this class and that that can undercut the longer term relationship. So we decided that at least to start, the relationship needed to be between me and her, and that we would facilitate what was going to happen between the inside folks and the outside folks. So last fall, um, everybody loves, as you, as you know, in all parts of life, everybody loves to do things around the holidays. Um, and there's a lot of stuff around the holidays. There's not a lot of stuff on the 360 other days of the year that don't have to be a holiday, that happen to be a big, major holiday. Like today, right, St. Patrick's Day. So because it was fall, we chose Halloween. And so I, the class, I scrapped the syllabus. I said, all right, for these three or four days, I bought a bunch of craft stuff, and I am like the least crafty person on the planet. But I bought a lot of stuff that seemed to be craft related, also within the guidelines of what was allowed, no stickers, no glue, no glitter, et cetera. We had literally paper and pencils, whoops, and a few templates. We'll get that back up. Yep. Um, and we made Halloween cards. And so, so a class of 35 <laughs> students made 300 Halloween cards, and every woman who was incarcerated on Halloween got a Halloween card. Not a big heavy lift, not a major investment, but a way to start the relationship. So at the end of the semester, beginning, you know, over the winter break, I talked to Rachel again. I said, okay, I'm going to try something a little bit different this time. I'd really like for there to be a dialogue between the students in my class and some incarcerated folks. And so what we settled on, again, not wanting letters to pass individually, what we decided to do, this is a small course of like 15 people, it's called Intersectional Feminisms. Again, it seems perfect for this kind of project. So what we're doing is we're taking a tour of the facility actually next week. Um, and that was important to me because I wanted it to feel familiar, close to home. Now I know where it is in my backyard so that before they started communicating with folks on the inside they would actually have a vision in their head of what the inside was what does the place look like so we're touring next week and then for the second half of the semester we start late so please i will appreciate all your kind thoughts in memorial day when we're having graduation and everybody else is done so second half of the semester um we co-created three writing prompts that are connected to some of the reading that we're doing. So we're, I, I chose some, some thoughts from Angela Davis's, uh, for me, most important, one of like pivotal work, Women, Race, and Class, and thought a little bit about what she's arguing in Women, Race, and Class and came up with writing prompts. And it'll, look, it'll work, I'm actually gonna take your idea and have you do voice notes, but the idea is that the students on the outside will write you know, a page or a page and a half about a prompt. 
Those letters will then be, or those papers will then be delivered to Rachel. Rachel will distribute them to folks on the inside who will respond, and those will come back, and we'll just do it three times. They get a few points for each, you know, exchange. In terms of the syllabus, they get a few points for each exchange. They have to write a final reflection paper to talk a little bit about, in which they'll talk about how going inside and having a tour, communicating with people, these writing prompts, helps them think more about intersectional feminist theory. Um, so it's got a, it's, it's got a, a curricular component, thinking about you know, how it connects the course material to the assignments, but it's low stakes. And it's, it's not that, again, the reason I think you asked me to talk a little bit about it is for people who might think, I want to do something, but I'm not ready yet to teach an inside out class, or I don't have the funds to be able to do that, or I don't have the space in my curriculum, or the chair in my department won't allow me to count that on my load, or whatever, 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 that, that using the prison care model, there's a lot of really low stakes possibilities to begin to have the conversation. You know, the, my, my only disappointment about this, this example was there was nothing coming back. So what I'm excited about, and the prompts are things like, what was a time, where's the time in your life that you felt really, really good about things? When's a time in your life you didn't feel so good about things? So a little bit maybe, not necessarily higher stakes than the prompts you were talking about, but connected to the reading that we're doing. So people will be thinking about, am I an outsider? Am I an insider? Those sorts of things. And I'm excited to see the, the connection because I think whether it's prison care or inside out or any of these types of programs, the whole point is to humanize everyone. The whole point is that for folks on the inside to be seen, to be visible, to be acknowledged as human beings. And I'm hoping that, you know, we started with cards, now we're gonna do these letter exchanges or these writing prompt exchanges, um, that that will just continue to happen and that students after, you know, classes after classes after classes of students will have a little bit of exposure, and if it sticks, then maybe they, maybe we'll end up with a compassion team for Baylor, which I think would be really great. Maybe they'll take a, an inside out course. Maybe they'll be inspired to do something else by just starting with a little seed. So that's kind of, that's what I got. Awesome. That's real simple. I do like the voice thing. I'm going to that opportunity. Yeah, so what time is it? It is 4.30, we have 15 minutes. 15 minutes, perfect. Okay, so the 15 minutes is yours. Let's just turn the lights up. Yeah, let's turn the lights okay. up. And um, yeah. And how about start with the round of applause? <laughs> so, yeah, I would love to hear, first of all, I'd love to answer any questions. And then I would also love to have input from you guys. What do you think we should be doing? Who do you think we should be trying to partner with and approach? What sounds to you like, oh, I could see this kind of thing? Anything, anything. Just educate me. You know, or ask me questions. Yes. Something that popped up in my head when you were talking about um, your son saying that he doesn't want to tell their stories without their consent was there should be, a, you might have already thought about this, but a prison care book about how the residents in the prison feel about how they can make that set you better. And that could be a book that they get paid for. Just um, yeah. It's like, um, and then also it could be a book that lobbyists could use, so <laughs> they could read pages and say like, this is what they're going through, this is what they need and are seeking out, and it could be a fundraiser, it could be a um, way for them to get paid and also have them sit for their story. That's a brilliant. That is brilliant. That is brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, they're going to be all over the place. <laughs> yeah. That's a brilliant. Thank you for that so much. Sabrina, yeah. thank you for this presentation and for Valerie. Yeah, like, that would change. Not, not at all. <laughs> um, and thank Dylan and Jay. 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 Yeah. So my question is, I know that you said at the beginning this is for both staff and for residents, mm -hmm. but I haven't quite understood how staff is involved yet. So that's involved. been a little tricky. Um, our compassion team has tried several staff appreciation initiatives, endeavors. Something, something. Um, and we are suspect because we care about residents, and apparently you're supposed to pick, and you're only allowed to care about one or the other. So, for example, um, the first week of May every year is National Correctional Officer Appreciation Week. We 
contacted somebody in HR at the prison. We got a current count of how many uh, COs and staff there were. We told her that we would like to send um, an appreciation gift that our team has adopted their facility, right? Oh, that's such a cool idea. Everything was great. Um, so we purchased 115 $5 Walmart gift cards and we had our team and their families create handwritten appreciation cards. Thank you for a hard job, well done. Happy National Correctional Officer. And we insured it and sent it. And somebody in HR got a whole lot of Walmart stuff for free because those cards were never distributed. They didn't distribute it to the staff? No. See? So, yeah, that's my case too. And you know that you know that they used the, all those cards? No, but they could we know that they were delivered because we insured and Isn't there a them. law against giving gifts to staff of um, you know, I don't know, and it's maybe there is. somebody in yeah. HR might have mentioned that when we were asking them if this was a good idea or not. So it could have been that there's, isn't there, am I right on that? There's a law that you can't receive any monetary gift if you work for the state. I have no idea. Sure there is. But if so, I mean, that's why we reached out to HR first. We figured that would be a good person to ask, right? I don't know. Okay. I mean, and I guess define gift. Like, I work for the University of Delaware. Technically, I work for the state. Um, I haven't turned down any gifts yet. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, there's a difference between like a gift card and Starbucks, maybe? I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to look into but it. I think but anyway, that one bombed. Yeah. And so then we decided to try to go a really different route. And um, so we're, we're across the country. So like what I would love to do if we were, if we were adopting a prison that was close by, I would love to like plan to do something like, like signs and honk if, if you appreciate correctional officers yeah. and seriously like pick the first Tuesday in May or whatever and stand out for the facility at shift change and yeah. hand out chocolate as people are on their way out and just be like, we do appreciate you by the way, you're law enforcement and you get ignored all the time. Um, those would be simple things. But Have you had a meeting where you listened to the, stuff, the correctional staff and said, what is it that you need? What would be something that would be appropriate? So, so far we can only get retired correctional staff to talk to us. So, to you know what people want currently? It's, this is the thing, we're suspect right out the gate because we're not promoting us versus them mentality. Right. So there's some, I recently um, spoken with Brian Kane at Social Profit Corrections, which is the only U.S. nonprofit private prison company in the United States. They've been around for two years. Check them out, spcor.org, social profit preference. Anyway, and he was career warden in Port Civic, which is my son's in a private facility, Port Civic owned. And so Brian is from Port Civic. That was his whole career. And he recommended that we try to connect with the correctional officer unions in each state because they would be yeah. in that would give legitimacy. Yeah. So we gave up on that and we said, okay, we'll try something like really low key and really, you know, organic. And so we had an, this is so tacky, but you know, Elf on the Shelf, where we did Elf in a Cell. And <laughs> we had the guys that were, that our event pals ask around and have everybody make anonymous nominations for a CO who was just awesome. Who was doing a really good job and who was doing it with integrity, but also with respect for our own facility. And the same name kept coming up and kept coming up and kept coming up. And so we just sent her a Christmas card and said, you should know that you were chosen as the CEO who was awesome and who's doing a great job and a whole bunch of people anonymously nominated you and we think you're fabulous. And she, she did get the Christmas card and she was blown away. And she figured it was, you know, it was signed by the Prison Care Compassion team and she knows that, that Jay and Dylan do stuff on behalf of prison care. And so she came to them and she says, did you guys know about this? They're like, we don't know what you're talking about. You know, and she was like, it made me cry when I opened that card. You should just tell those people it made me cry. Um, so, you know, we're looking for little ways to just begin to build trust. But I think a part of the answer is gonna be that some compassion teams are gonna to choose to focus primarily on staff, mm -hmm. but with a neighborhood mentality. And other compassion teams are gonna find that they are able to really focus on residents, but again, so in all of our pen pal letters, we encourage the use of a, of a virtues-based vocabulary, and so we encourage people, especially early on when you're writing back and forth, that first exchange of real letters, once you get over the clunky first letter, um, to find a way to use the word respect. Say something that you respect about something that they told you. So that from the starting gate, you're leaning into this idea of mutual respect, 
knowing who you are and carrying yourself well. And every time they mention an area where they've done that, like call it out and put the weirdo virtues language to it. You know, you showed a lot of integrity. Like put these words, because these are not words they are hearing and they need to hear them. But at the same time, when they talk about a CEO who is a jerk, without getting preachy, you just say, wow, that must have been really hard. And it sounds like they were having a really tough day too. Like plant the seed of individual humanness in each of the staff. And in no time, you guys, in no time, our friends open up and they're like, I've been thinking a lot about this. And I've realized that so-and-so, you know, I know for a fact that they, they just lost their spouse to cancer a couple of months ago. We all know it. And we all act like we don't know it because we didn't like them before they lost their spouse to cancer. But maybe we can be cut them a little yeah. bit of slack. You know, like it catches on so quickly. So, um, yeah, so staff is tricky. And we're having to figure out how to do that. And I think that that's going to be a really complex process as it unfolds. And I think it's definitely going to require help from um, the unions, probably. I think you make an interesting point that I have quite thought through, Sabrina, that I think it's always tricky with staff, but it's probably a lot trickier when it's remote. Because I think of, like, your example of these thinking signs. Also, in, in the, with the person Rachel I've been working with, I mean, she would say, you know, if you all want to bring your class and bring goodie bags at Halloween, bring them, and you can stand out at, you know, at shift change. So I think that it's an additional challenge. Yeah, when, from a distance. From a distance, because you're dependent on someone inside the facility right. to manage it. When if it's when if you're geographically close enough, you can. It would be easier. It would probably be easier, mm -hmm. yeah. But that's, mm -hmm. that's such an interesting question. We were working with the chaplain, um, who then left, unfortunately, before, right before Christmas. But we said, could we um, find a way to purchase a bunch of catered food to have sent into the staff room on Christmas Day for anybody who has to work, just so they can eat like real food? And it can even be anonymous. You don't have to say it was from prison care. Like, could we just do that? He thought that was a great idea, and then he quit like two weeks later, so he couldn't make it happen. But so we're trying to find creative ways, you know? Um, but it's a challenge. I think the other thing to bear in mind is exactly this really nice metaphor about you know prisons as neighborhoods. Um, the UK experience around arts in, in prisons is when staff, uniform staff, see changes um, more widely among prisoners, so there's, there's less disciplinary stuff going on, mm -hmm. you know, there's less violence or whatever, and you're in the prison at that time, and you know, they can see there's a relationship. Right. Between what, what you're doing and what's happening on the landings. And they connect the dots. That, that, that warms, you know, people's hearts very much, I think. And, and it's, you know, the work you're doing, the thing you're saying about the, the letter writing and just seeing, you know, these different attitudes. It takes time. It does. But um, I think it can be really effective. I hope so. I should tell you one quick story of a, of a success very recently. We, um, we wanted to, like I said, we wanted to cater a staff lunch for uh, Christmas Day. We weren't able to do that. We had also done a podcast episode with Dylan where he talked about the power of the spread, that when they make food together, it is so different than eating in the chow hall, you know? <laughs> and so we said, um, how much money would it take to buy enough ingredients from commissary that you guys could do a spread for your whole pot so that nobody was left out? Because then there's no question of extortion. If everybody gets the same thing, then staff is okay with it being extorted. So they decided that quesadillas was the way to go and they did all the calculations and they said for 200 bucks we can feed everybody a stuffed quesadilla. We're like well that's easy. So in no time a couple people from our team had put money on Jay's books and Dylan's books so that because you can only buy so much at a time you know so we had they ordered all the ingredients because then there was a glitch in commissary, so everything was delayed by a week, and then commissary ran out of supplies and one thing, so they were still short a few sausages, but they had to cook sooner, the tortillas were going to bat, blah, blah, blah. So it didn't happen for Christmas, but on January 26th, they finally um, put the word out, and they said, like, we're so close. Prison care wanted to throw us a quesadilla party, but we still need, like, a few, and guys went into their personal stashes, and they contributed the ingredients that were missing. They started prepping at 4 a.m. They served and cleaned up the last quesadilla at 5 p.m. They fed 
everybody in the pod, they made handmade signs and put them all around. Casa de Quesadillas Day, compliments <laughs> of prison care, Life Path Church. And um, they fed all these people. So middle of the afternoon, Jay was sitting in his boss's office. He's a trainer in the dog program. He was in his boss's office. Guys are coming by. They keep popping their heads in and going, Jay, thanks for the quesadillas. It was so cool. It was so cool. Mm-hmm. Another guy comes in, excuse me, I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt, Captain, but quesadillas, thanks, man. Okay. They go, third person. <laughs> After the third person, his captain goes, okay, what the fuck is up with the quesadillas? He's <laughs> like, we're having a quesadilla party for the pod. She's like, what do you mean for the pod? He's like, for everybody. Like, she says, you fed quesadillas to 100 people. And he's like, yeah. She goes, you guys are really something. You confuse me. But she was obviously thrilled. Like, so they're living in questionable ways, in the right kind of question, right? They're raising questions. And staff are noticing. And staff saw them feed quesadillas to people that they know don't get along. You know? They saw them going door to door saying, don't miss out, man. Have you gotten your quesadilla yet? Everybody gets a quesadilla today. And they worked the whole pod all day long. And staff sees that. And staff goes, that's not fake. That's not anybody currying favor. That's not manipulative behavior. That's people acting like humans who care about other humans. Huh? Okay. You know, so it's little tiny drops, and that's what it's going to take. But, yeah. 